once again, everybody. Welcome to Shea Stadium in New York. And the first thing we talk about, the Mets, and they take the field before their adoring fans. Good luck to you. We look at him uh, on defense, the Mets, and in the outfield, we see Wilson, Dykstra, and Strawberry. The best arm out there belongs to Strawberry, but the Red Sox scouts say strong but a bit erratic. Knight, Santana, Tuffle will be at second base, Hernandez at first base, and he is the defensive general. He keeps control. He'll set the bear down intensity for that infield. And behind the plate, Gary Carter, and there's Ron Darling. Talking about coming a long way, Ron Darling, born in Honolulu, and was raised in Millbury, Massachusetts. That's near Worcester. In fact, it's pretty close to Holy Cross. And in 1975, in the storied World Series between the Red Sox and the Reds, why Ron Darling was in Fenway Bleachers in Game 6 when Carlton Fisk hit the memorable home run. And Darling has come from there to the mound at Shea. He is a 15-game winner this year. He was the king of the no decision. He was in 13 no decisions, but it's interesting that the Mets won 11 of those 13. He's got a fastball, a curve. He throws a split finger fastball, but he really doesn't throw it that hard. He uses it as an off speed pitch. The uh, when you talk to Davey about Ron Darling, he wants him to get ahead, stay ahead, but he is known as a nibber. He'll go inside and outside. And that sinker ball, he'll get some ground balls if he's got his good stuff. He used the telephone to talk to Mike Torres about the older Boston hitters. And then he talked to his teammate, Bobby Ojeda, about the young hitters. He has put all that knowledge together, listen to the scouts, and we'll see how he makes out. There are a couple of things I think even before the game starts that uh, you can see the players were worried about and this field looks great and it's a real tribute to the grounds crew for what they had to do something like 22 yards of topsoil 5,000 square feet of sod they had a graded and they really did a great job but it really looks better than it is there are some bad hops in there and outfielders will not be charging that recklessly and Base runners will be taking an extra base when that ball gets to the outfield if they see the slightest chance. We might as well tell you the temperature is 50 degrees. The wind out of the northeast at 9. And they're expecting the temperature late in the game to dip to 41 degrees as Wade Boggs begins a strike. There is certainly no surprise in Wade Boggs taking the first pitch. I think they figured out he swings at the first pitch only 5% of the time anyway. 0 and 1. Little chopper to third, short hop by Ray Knight to get him. The Wade Boggs, the Major League's leading hitter, tops to third. Ray Knight was playing shallow. He really gets it on his short hop. It's not an easy, as easy a play as it looks. But once he's got it, he's got him by yards. But he really didn't put a whole lot on that throw, and it wasn't that easy a play for Hernandez at first base. Where's the MVP of the LCS, Marty Barrett? We'll give you his league numbers and later on get into his daring do against California. He's the runner on the team. He led the Sox with 15 stolen bases. That's not many. And certainly with so many other teams, it comes as a shock. The Red Sox had the fewest stolen bases in the major leagues, only 41, and he led the club with the 15. Popped it foul, high and back of the plate. Gary Carter coming back. No play. Marty Barrett has a little habit, and I even asked him about it. Uh, his back foot, when he gets ready to hit, he moves it. And I said to him, why do you do that, Marty? He says, I don't know. Now, Jack Clark of the Cardinals does the same thing. But watch when he gets set right before he's ready to swing, he'll make that move. But whatever it does for him, it helps him because he had some championship series. Now watch him. The American Leaguers feel he's a high fastball hitter, and he likes the ball away. And that's just what he got, away, and he smothers it into right field. 
So they pitched him away and he went with it and singled a right and Marty Barrett comes up with the first base hit of the 1986 World Series. Boy what a story he is. He really is and you'll see him uh, he just really throws that bat at the ball and he, what he tries to do is hit that ball to right field because he says I'd rather be jammed inside than to strike out on an outside pitch. So he's always going towards right field and with a man on base he is doubly tough. Well have you ever wondered what happened to Johnny Unitas's old shoes that looks like Bill Buckner is wearing them but actually they're brand new. A strike. Buckner with bad ankles torn up legs and knees and he has those high tops on and he said I will never play another game without them. He has changed his hitting style and considering the fact he was so effective throughout oh, almost 15 years. But a year and a half ago he became a Walt Riniak student and now he's taking a chapter right out of Charlie Lau. You'll watch him with all of his weight on his back leg. One thing Walt Riniak teaches and he is the first base coach is when Buckner or any of his pupils get through the strike zone once they have made contact as the bat just about finishes the plate the top hand will come off the bat. In the dirt good save by Carter. That was an exceptionally good save because it was a breaking ball and the breaking ball will always break not continue to go way it's going it'll break back towards uh, Gary Carter's left shoulder watch when it hits the dirt if that's a fastball it keeps going straight but you see it take that right turn almost and Gary got in front of it nicely and I tell you it saves the man from going to second base scoring position and yet you'll not see that in the box score Darling is the kind of man who has a very slow move to first to lull you and then he has a pretty good one now that's strictly a commercial move that wouldn't sell you any land in Florida. But later on when he's really serious he can have a pretty good move. Slice foul and out of play. The Red Sox this year scored more runs in the first inning than any other inning. So they come out of the shoot with a runner at first and one out and Buckner and Rice back to back. The one thing the Red Sox uh, really don't do as opposed to the Mets is manufacture runs. Uh, they've got some power. They got some guys that can wait for the three run homer and they were getting it all year. Marty Barrett held on by Keith Hernandez. Two and two the count to Bill Buckner one away. Just starting up. Ground ball to the right side to Tuffle. They get one Santana to Hernandez and Buckner could barely get down the 90 feet. So the double play four six three and at the end of half an inning Red Sox nothing Mets coming up. will have Mookie Wilson followed by Len Dykstra and Keith Hernandez. Mookie in the leadoff role this year hit three leadoff home runs and he has six in his career. Strike. Oh and one to Mookie. Hit in the eye March the 5th 21 stitches around the area injured in a rundown play in spring training but he came back. That's a strike one and one. Hurst has a good curveball. He throws a fork ball, has a fastball, and he'll use all of them. Most pitchers, when they get in the jam, have a I'll go to pitch. Uh, with Hurst, he'll go to any of the three. So the pitch to Mookie down at the ankles. Wilson with Dykstra hitting second, and considering Buckner's bad leg at first base, we could look for a couple of things. Down he goes. Let's take a look at Boston with the leather. The defense for Boston Rice is in uh, left field. Henderson is in center field. Evans is in right field. The best arm out there belongs to Evans and he can really throw. Boggs on Barrett Buckner in the infield. Getman behind the plate. And Ben I think right here we're going to see that chance for Buckner because Dykstra wants to get something started because I think that Davey Johnson would like to send a message over to McNamara that we're going to run and uh, try to manufacture some runs and Hurst you could see pointed to Buckner be alive. And he's going to run up and take a look at it. We'll keep an eye on Buckner as well. You might have wondered if Buckner has a bad leg why didn't they play hit and run in the first inning to try and avoid the double play evidently McNamara wanted to keep Hernandez on the bag and he wanted to give Buckner the hole on the right side of the infield. 
Bobby Dykstra moving up in the box on that pitch. Ball two. two well, he, he's very effective when he does that. He pulls that infield in. As you can see, Boggs is in close to third base, and all he has to do is what Casey Stengel used to call that butcher boy swing, hit down on the ball and get the bouncing ball, and he's on. The fellow who's in motion is Marty Barrett, the second baseman. He really has to cover on a bunt, and he knows he's got to cover a lot of ground with an ailing Buckner. Two and one to count to Dykstra, the kid who is called Nails. If nothing else, he has the Red Sox thinking bunt and the count two balls and two strikes. Just watching him fake that bunt, you can just see everybody moving, and once you have the infielders going, percentage comes to your to your side. He was a 13th round draft choice by the Mets and stubbornly insisted on a contract for class A ball. Got him. To put that in proper perspective on Dykstra both Strawberry and Gooden started out in a rookie league. Dykstra guards that plate well but from Hurst you can see a breaking ball and I mean he starts it from about first base and he gets him fairly easy. That's two strikeouts for Bruce Hurst. His high this year, he had 14. And here is Keith Hernandez. In there. Two down, first inning, no score. So pull up a chair for game one of the 86 series the Red Sox and the Mets. Breeze blowing out to right. 0 and 1. The Mets were notorious slow starters in the LCS. They hit less than 50 points collectively in the first three innings of their games and then they came with a rush 10 almost half of their runs came from the ninth inning on. Two balls one strike. When you look at a batter like Hernandez and you wonder what checkpoints hitters use from the center field shot you can see his three checkpoints very well. It's the front shoulder he has to keep it in. Don't wrap the bat around his head and keep his hands out. Ground foul. Interesting story came out of the last game in Houston. Hernandez was 0 for 3 ran back to the clubhouse and called his brother Gary in California because he respects Gary so much. He said am I swinging the bat all right. Gary said you're swinging the bat well but you're too tentative go up there and attack next at bat he doubled home Wilson scored the tying run and the rest is history Fly ball to center going back on it is Dave Henderson he has a play the wind cut that thing in half and the first inning is in the books the Mets are gone in order and at the end of an inning the Red Sox nothing and the Mets nothing We're going to the second inning at Shea Stadium in New York. No score. The Boston Red Sox and the New York Mets in game one. It'll be Jim Rice, Dwight Evans, and then Rich Gedman. Jim Rice, who had two home runs in the LCS, both of them at Fenway Park in game two and game seven. And you might remember he missed the 1975 World Series. He was hit on the wrist and suffered a broken hand hit by Vern Rule, who of course was with the California Angels this year. But Rice finally in and ready to play. Watching him walk in and talking to him, we're talking about hitting the first pitch. He says, before I go in the batter's box, I have my mind made up as to whether I'm going to swing at that first pitch or not. So he's already programmed. And he has those great credentials 2000 hits MVP in 1978 and here we go. A little high with a fastball. He's choked up a bit on the bat but there are times when he'll get down on the end you can see about an inch or so but when he gets down on the end he's going to play long ball with you. One and oh. Fastball fouled away. If Rice had his way. Number one he will swing at the first fastball which he has done he's a very good high ball hitter. So if you're going to give him fastballs you'd better come way inside on him. And the Angels did a pretty good job on him with breaking stuff. Off speed beautiful pitch by Darling in the count one and two. He's a little bit away from that plate I think maybe a little bit more than he normally is. There was that split finger. You could see it as he released it. And back with a fastball and missed. Ball two. Two and two. 
Here's where the good pitcher puts something extra on because he still has some percentage. He wants it to happen on two and two. Three and two, he loses a little bit of that. And even though it's not a base on balls, he hurts himself. High again, ball three. The Red Sox had a base hit by Marty Barrett in the first inning, and the Mets went out in order. You know, in nine of the last 14 years, the losing team in game one has scored two runs or less. Big chopper to third. Ray Knight is there. One away. So you get an indication that in the first game of the World Series, the pitchers are pretty much in control. And then if you go back into the record books, three of the five top strikeout games in World Series history have been in game one. When Gibson struck out 17 against Detroit, that was game one. When Koufax struck out 15 against the Yankees in 63, that was game one. To go way back when Howard Emke struck out 13 Cubs, that was game one. Here's Dwight Evans. And he promptly unloads into deep left center. That slanting wind is going to cut it down, and Dykstra has it. And I think that's out of here, except for that slanting wind blowing from left to right. He's not going to hit the ball any better than he just hit that one. Hit it to the deep part of the park, and the wind got it. You can see the reaction. Now, he's way back on that back foot, and he really gets into it. And it just dies. Dykstra finds the fence. Warning track tells him he's a little bit closer, and he just waits for it. Here's an interesting matchup now with Rich Gedman at the plate. We were talking before about Darling coming a long way. Darling went to St. John's High School. Gedman went to St. Peter's Marion in Worcester, and they faced each other in high school. At the time, Darling was a sophomore, Gedman was a senior. Gedman came up to hit with runners at second and third and Darling walked him intentionally. But the interesting note in that game Gedman was the pitcher. Two and one. What are the odds playing against each other in Worcester in high school and here you are head to head in New York in the World Series at a different position. A very unusual left hand hitter he likes the ball up. And he's jammed and pops it up on the left side at Santana. So the Sox are done thanks to the wind and that one run very much gone with the wind and at the end of an inning and a half no score. The one that goes over the plate for a strike. <laughs> That's, if I want a uh, fork ball and my breaking ball I think I can get by with a mediocre fastball. Well we'll see about Bruce Hurst getting by with a mediocre fastball because Gary Carter who is a high ball hitter will start it off then Darryl Strawberry and Ray Knight. One of Carter's problems the experts tell me during the LCS was that he was trying to pull everything and when he would take his stride he would land on his heel and he was a dead meat up there. Well they were throwing breaking balls the outside part of the plate and what they did they forced him to widen his zone and it's tough to hit the bad ball. Strike. Oh, and one to count. Davy Johnson, who has been in four World Series as a player, now piloting the New York Mets. Hit off the end of the stick, roll to the right side, bad hop, and Barrett stayed with it. Good play by Marty. That thing almost kangarooed and got him. The grass is extra fast. They mowed it yesterday, but again, remember what we talked about earlier. That ball just takes a bad hop. But there you see Marty staying right with it. It's been said many times, and it took a league championship series to really point it out. But one of the most underrated players in all of baseball was young Marty Barrett. Interesting now the confrontation with Darrell Strawberry. Feast or famine for him. He is a better low ball hitter. And he certainly likes the ball out over the plate so he can get full extension of his arm. So left handers like to curve him a lot. Foul back. One and one. Gedman behind the plate. He'll move. He'll move late so that he protect himself against the batters who peak. But that glove is his target. He's made himself into a fine catcher. One ball, one strike. On the inside corner. Interesting contrast. Where you were seeing people like Boggs and Buckner, the Charlie Lau school with weight on the back leg, 
Bill Robinson who is Strawberry's hitting instructor wants him more erect at the plate. He doesn't want his weight all the way back. And he's caught looking and down he goes. Three strikeouts for Bruce Hurst. There was a case of using the slow curveball, throwing the fork ball, and then that fastball that he says I can get by with a mediocre fastball. You can if the other two pitches will set it up for you, and that's exactly what he did there. Talking about Bill Robinson, that's a unique way he teaches hitting. He says hitting is rhythm. He says I really don't teach hitting, I teach batting, so he plays a radio now and then. If you like country western, he puts that on, <laughs> soul, <laughs> rock, whatever. Hit according to the rhythm. Here's Ray Knight. Knight's a high ball hitter, so we'll see if they stay down on him. No, they come up high, ball one. Mistake. He had the Mets' highest batting average against left handers during the year. He had 376 against left handers. Now he works in low. John McNamara, who has piloted five teams, the record is six, held by Dick Williams and the late Jimmy Dykes. Two and all. And he's staying up and away, and he's behind three and oh. That's Those were two mistakes, Ben. You can tell with uh, Gedman when he gives his sign, watch his right hand whenever we have that shot up there because we can't keep it up there all night. But he'll he'll give you a location. He wanted it down. Three and oh. And he is high again. So to a high ball hitter. Apparently he was trying to come inside high and he couldn't do it. So he walks him on four and the batter now is Tim Tuffle. And of course Tuffle has had experience in the American League so Hurst is no stranger to him. Tim goes against left handers while he backman against right handers. Hurst has a good move uh, not that much of, not that much of a base runner but if you remember in our opening Davey Johnson talking about Clemens and Hurst having balk moves he'll hang you with that front leg Hurst will and he can really hold you on and he's got him if he had it gotten over there in a hurry he had him leaning the wrong way well they're calling balk already because I tell you he's got a good move watch how he almost looked to the plate now he'll go to first. I tell you, he had him leaning. He popped his shoestrings. He has an American League umpire at first, Jim Evans, who is accustomed to seeing that move. That might be a good point for Bruce to capitalize on. The Jim just keeping an eye on him. He'll be the plate umpire tomorrow night. We have the big confrontation between Roger Clemens and Dwight Gooden. Knight with two down at first, held on by Buckner. Hurst with that move has picked off 35 runners in the last couple of years, but only four in 1986. He had 11 last year in the American League. Said, wait a minute, we'll have to hang close with this guy. Oddly enough, no box were called on him last uh, this season. 2 0. Oh. Now he's digging a little hole. He might have an escape hatch on deck in Rafael Santana, but he would just as soon start the inning with Santana. Instead, with two out, he's behind a tuffle, three and zero. Oh. Two down, second inning, no score. And it's in there. Three and one. Tuffle has pretty good running speed, and Hurst trying to tie up the runner at first. If the count were different, he would certainly play run and hit. With the count three and one, let's see. Not against Hurst Smooth. Gedman looking over at the bench a couple of times, and you can bet that what McNamara is telling him is to just get the ball over the plate. Knight is not a base threat. He has not stolen a base this year. Line drive, base hit in left field. Knight to second and holding, and Jim Rice will get it back in. So with two out, a walk and a single to left. Remember the count was three and one. He had to come in with that ordinary fastball. When the pitcher has to go deep for three balls, one strike, three balls, two strikes, he's in a little bit of trouble. Now get him asking the bear down, and I'll tell you, Santana is one of the players that they talked about because of the scouts, Sam Mealy and uh, let's see, Wayne Britton was well, another one of the scouts. Uh, Santana has been hot, and they were talking about him coming down the end of the season. Santana's been a hot hitter up there. Hacking, as they say. Tell you how he hacked. In the last month of the season, Santana hit 280. 
All right, Marty Barrett has had a few words with Hurst. You have runners at first and second. No speed at second base, certainly, in Ray Knight. And Tuffle at first. Two down, no score, second inning. And here's Santana. Dwight Evans in right field taking charge of moving Henderson, who's a little bit over in right center field. In there, 0 and 1. So after pitching behind, walking Knight, and then 3 and 1 tonight, he starts Santana with a strike. 0 and 1. The pitcher, Ron Darling, following Santana. A comebacker. Hurst has it, has to take a little time, goes to Buckner, and that's it. No runs, one hit, and two left at the end of two, no score. And we'll be right back after these messages from your local station. Tonight's game is brought to you by AT&T, the right choice. And by Michelin, Michelin. Because so much is riding on your tires. The third inning of our first game with Dave Henderson, followed by Spike Owen, and then Bruce Hurst. Here's Walt Reniak, the pride of Natick, Massachusetts, the home of Doug Flutie, Joe Coleman, and Walt Reniak. And here's Rene Latchman who back in 1962 was the ball boy for the Los Angeles Dodgers, later to become a big league manager at Seattle. Dave Henderson to start it off. One for nine in the LCS, but oh, what a one it was. Boy, did he pick that ball club up. He's become a folk hero. Popped in the air off to the right coming over is Gary Carter to the edge of the dugout no play it's back in about two rows. John Kibler the National League working behind the plate Jim Evans at first Harry Wendelstead at second Joe Brinkman at third and on the lines Ed Montague of the National League at left Dale Ford of the American League in right. Gary Carter knows that that wind in this ballpark swirling so he's going to make sure he just checks everything out he got right next to that fence made sure it was in the stands. The American League pitchers like to keep the ball very much in on Henderson and Darling works away. How much did you put how much credence did you put on scouting reports when you played in the series. If I wasn't sure I believed them all but if I had better ideas I went with what I thought. Oh and two. Fastball hit to straightaway center. Back goes Dykstra, and he has room. So far, the only difference in the game, the ball hit by Dewey Evans that might have gone out in the daytime for sure and without the wind at night. Then just an interesting thing as you watch the set and we watch our monitors, when Carter Number gives five, his sign, you can five. see his fingers below his body, and many times that can be picked up by other ball clubs. That's one way you steal signs. I saw that in the championship series. I asked him about it it's to help his infielders. Now he doesn't do it on every pitch. We we'll take a look at it as Owen fouls it back. On his center field shot, on certain pitches, he'll drop, and you can see the fingers. Usually you got him right up against your leg, so nobody can see him except your pitcher. Well, how did he get into that habit of doing it? It's not a habit, it, it, it's on purpose. Now he hit that one well. That's a strike. It began with Wally Bachman, who couldn't see certain pitches, and he wanted to know about it. And, and so they said, well, I'll help you on those pitches. What, what he wants to do, Bachman, is to know the pitch so he can relay it to Hernandez and doesn't want pitchers changing up on their own. The Mets have just brought Darryl Strawberry in about three steps and over to his right. Fouled away down the left field line out of play. You know, everybody talks about Spike and his five errors in the LCS. But remember in game six he went four for four and in game seven he went two for four. He made some valuable contributions. But forget the five errors they're here. No balls two strikes. Fouled off. 
That was a perfect shot of exactly what I was talking about. You can see the two fingers below the body, and with nobody on base, you know he's just flashing one sign. It was curveball. But he doesn't do it on every pitch. And that's what you have to be careful about because tell a hitter a curveball is coming and a fastball shows up, he's not going to believe you the rest of his life. Right, don't blame him. 0 oh and 2 to spike on, one away, top of the third, no score. Split finger job picks up his first strikeout, and we have two down in the third inning. And now here comes Bruce Hurst after we look at that split finger job. You can really see it. Look at the rotation. He uses as a change of speed, breaks down and away. It's split finger. That seems to be the word of the 80s, and certainly Roger Craig is the guy who who brought it into fashion. But uh, pitches don't change. It's a fork ball going back to Elroy Face, Mort Cooper, and going way back. Bruce Hurst in his first major league at bat. He said he hit in double A at Bristol, Connecticut. He got a single against the St. Louis Cardinals in an exhibition game this year, and he got great advice from his brother in St. George, Utah. Is this typical brother yeah. advice? The brother said, "Don't embarrass the family." That's right. That's terrific. <laughs> oh, and two. Well, for the Bruce Hurst marching in Chowder Society, what in the world would you expect? And at the end of two and a half, no score. Ron Darling will start it off, followed by Mookie Wilson, then Len Dykstra. Bottom of the third inning, no score. Low numbers, but Ron is considered a pretty good hitting pitcher as he takes a strike. 0 and 1. You would think the Mets pitchers were in the American League and they had at bats for the first time. They were 0 for 13 in the LCS. 0 and 2. And they had just one sacrifice bunt. I don't know if it's because they're not very good or the Houston pitching is as great as it was in the series, the LCS, and of course all season. I'd give the nod to the Houston pitching. I would too. <laughs> Buddy Harrelson, the third base coach, coming over to pick that up. Buddy played every inning of every game in the 1969 World Series and the 1973 World Series. 0 oh 2 to Ron Darling. Over at first base is Bill Robinson and Bill played in the 1979 World Series. He played for Pittsburgh against Baltimore and of course on the Baltimore team his current manager Davey Johnson got him. So for Hurst four strikeouts. Remember he had 14 in a game against Texas so he can do it. Here's the Mets. You also notice the pitchers are blowing on their hands. They're allowed to do that in this weather. It started at 50 degrees and it's going to get colder down in the 40s. And you notice they're not fooling around on the mound too much. Whatever move they make is serious. Get the ball and throw. Mookie struck out in the first inning. 0 for 1. You hear the expression framing the pitch. You get a pretty good idea today as we look at Oil Cam Boyd just sitting on the bench trying to stay warm. One and one. Simplified framing the pitch is keeping that glove and catching the ball in the strike zone, borderline especially. Fouled away. One and two. I was wondering whether Mookie was going to try and bunt. He likes to drag and push, and especially push right handed. And I'm still waiting for the Mets to exploit Bill Buckner at first base, or at least to attempt to. They haven't tried it. One and two to Mookie Wilson. Ground ball slowly and foul outside of third. So Mookie will come back and try it again. A little history here as we look at Shea Stadium. It opened up the 17th of April 1964. Across the street was the World's Fair. And they certainly broke it in right. They had a 23 inning game where they lost to the Giants. Jim Bunning pitched a perfect game here the first year. The All Star game was played here in 64. And Ron Hunt was the first Met to play in it. The Mets had a a big role in that 64 pennant race, won eventually by the Cardinals. Ground ball up the middle, base hit for Mookie Wilson. Well, you can bet we'll see some action. He set the first move. 
But Mookie Wilson is a very impatient runner, and if Hurst can hold that ball, he may catch him breaking, but we're going to have some action. I can almost guarantee it. That's what it looked like to Hurst coming back. He'd fallen towards third base. That ball, easy base hit. Now we have all kinds of possibilities. You have a straight steal from Mookie. You have a possible bunt by Dykstra. You could have a bunt and run. You could have a hit and run. And the Mets now trying to wake up early. A thing they couldn't do in the LCS. Davey Johnson even had his scouts time from the time the pitcher lifts his foot and goes to first base because they, they think they can beat the throw from the first baseman. That's pretty fine when you start measuring the time the pitcher takes from the mound to first base. Going over there again. Mookie's got some ideas, Vin. Oh, yes. Reason Dykstra is starting tonight and hitting in the number two slot is for just this kind of a moment to hit behind Wilson at first base. The right side of the infield is open with Buckner on the bag, and of course, Dykstra loves to bunt. Mookie holding. Ball one. You won't see Gedwin pitch out too much because he had an outstanding uh, year, and in the LCS, four out of five he nailed. So he can do it back there. He's checking his bench to see if he's going to, if McNamara wants to put a play on. Wilson stole 25 bases during the regular year. The Mets were four for four in stolen bases against the Astros. So our first real cat and mouse situation is right now. No score, bottom of the third, one out. Mookie Wilson, Dykstra, Backman, and Strawberry all have the green light. They only have no go signs. Mookie holding. Big breaking ball. Boy, did you see Dykstra flinch, duck, and back out of there. Wow. It was that slow curveball. He starts it right at him, and you can see Dykstra back out. Right here, he gives a lot of ground. He thinks he's going to be way inside. And look at Gevin bearing down more to get the strike. He was worried about the runner. One ball, one strike. Do you remember Dykstra had the big triple against Bob Nepper in the ninth inning of the winning game? And it was Dykstra who was low bridged by Nolan Ryan with one of those 95 mile an hour fastballs. And he then dug back in and hit a curveball into left field for a base hit. And they're really watching Mookie. Surprised he's not just trying to hold that ball and take the spring out of Mookie's legs, but he's going to try to wear him out by throwing over there, which is another way of getting that runner to lose the spring in his legs. One and one. There he goes. Pitch is high. Gedman is late. He had a tremendous jump. A great piece of base running by Mookie. It's a straight steal. Look at that head looking towards second base. And Gedman did everything he could to get him, but he really had no chance. He gets into it, guns it. Good ball to handle, but you'd have to blame that on Hurst. And now Gedman wants to go out and talk to his pitcher. And it's the obvious situation of changing signs with the man on at second base. If there is one decided edge, it's the overall speed and range of the Mets against the Red Sox. Plus, of course, remember that in this World Series, Whitey Herzog's idea has finally borne fruition. And the commissioner has used the designated hitter rule. No DH in the National League Park and DH in the American League Park. And that could be a big disadvantage for Boston. Two and one. Turned him around. Ball three. Almost got him. It was the fastball. Dykstra, he hangs in a long time. Listen, after being low bridge by a 95 Ryan job, that wasn't too much. But you know this guy coming up or used to go against batting machines and he kept moving closer to the machine closer to the machine as time is called now something out in left field. I asked him about that. He said he gave himself three years. He said I wanted to go to the big league. So he went down and hit against the pitching machine and he'd begin at 60 mm -hmm. feet and then he'd move closer and turn the speed of the machine up. He said I wanted good bat speed. That's what they ought to do tomorrow in batting practice because they're going to be looking at either Gooden or Clemens. You might as well hit about 50 feet in front of the plate. It's about what it'll seem like. Three and one to Dykstra. One out in the third. No score. Right. Three and two. 
That's what he does well. He'll make that pitcher work. He's trying to get on to get Hernandez up there. Boy, it's hand blowing time on the old plantation. Cold in New York. Three and two to Dykstra. Bruce Hurst, the 13 game winner during the regular season, trying to get the Red Sox off on the right foot. Pride of St. George, Utah. Three and two. Fouled away off to the left and out of play. There's Keith Hernandez on deck bare armed in a familiar pose. He says I have to be on my knee in the on deck circle because I want to see how the pitcher works the hitter in front of me especially if he's a left hand pitcher. Another thing we told you the story about his brother Gary well, Gary's here tonight so it'll save him a call. <laughs> Three and two to Lenny Dykstra. Mookie Wilson at second base. One out in the third. No score. He just shook him off a pitch, so Gedman and Hurst are not really in complete sync on what they want to do to Dykstra. Three and two. And he missed the ball four. And with two on. Especially against left hand pitching, tries to wait on that ball and go to the opposite field. He doesn't want to give up the center of the diamond. He'll go from the center of the diamond to left field, as, unless it's that real slow curveball. But usually, he'll, against a left hander, he'll use the middle of the diamond. Interesting seeing Hernandez. He was a member of the last National League team to win the World Series, the 82 Cardinals. And he's up there now trying to get the Mets off and winging. 4 1. Interesting combination here because the Red Sox, their pitchers allowed the fewest walks in the majors. They average just under three. And you have a hitter up there who walks a lot in Keith Hernandez. Hurst has already walked two batters tonight while striking out four. Two balls, no strike. Here you can see the combination, and now Bill Fisher, who holds the record for consecutive innings without a walk, is trying to go out there and solve the riddle. And I'll tell you what would probably help if it was about 20 degrees warmer, Hurst would probably have a better grip on the ball. Well, that could be, but he wants him to be the Bruce Hurst that everybody has seen. He doesn't want him to be pitching any different. But you can see he's put a little extra in there. He's in the jam, and now Hernandez, two balls and no strikes. He can really sit on a particular pitch and pretty much do what he wants with it. Bill Fisher trying to counsel Bruce Hurst. His record, 84 and a third consecutive scoreless innings. Bill, who had a 20 year career as a pitcher, nine of them in the big leagues, now huddling with John McNamara, and Fish is getting on the phone to the bullpen. Two balls and no strikes to Keith Hernandez. Wilson at second with a single and a stolen base. And Dykstra at first on the walk. Al Nipper begins to throw in the Cardinal bullpen. A throwback, but not in time to get Wilson. Good throw by Gedman. That was one of those uh, I'll be there plays. He saw the shortstop Owen sneak in there. There's no set play here. Two balls and no strikes. You can see he thinks he's got a chance. And I tell you, he made it pretty close. And if nothing else, that'll cut Mookie's lead down and maybe get a chance for a play at the plate. Makes your ball club look good when you do things like that. Harry Wendelstead, the second base umpire, right there to call it. Two and one. The count to Hernandez. There's Harry. Hooking, he is going to one hand it, tagging up is Wilson and goes to third and the throw to Marty Barrett, who'll run it back to the infield. Oh, what a dandy play by Dwight Evans in the corner. It ended up in foul territory, but I tell you, that was not a typical Hernandez swing. You could see he was going for the downs on three and all. 
And Evans really makes a good play. Didn't have a whole lot of room between the foul line and the wall. And Mookie is able to pick up the extra base. But if Evans was way over. It was a long run. But I'll tell you something. That swing by Hernandez, you won't see that. I'll bet you three times a year because he just went after a high fastball. He was going for downtown. So Mookie Wilson at third. Lenny Dykstra had to hold at first. Marty Barrett going deep into right field to handle the throw from Dwight Evans. The wind has got Evans talking to himself. Remember, his bid for a home run was cut down, and the wind was blowing that ball away from him as he almost ran into the wall full tilt. Here's Gary Carter, grounded to second in the second inning. Ball one. Here's Hernandez swing. Watch him really go out after it. I mean, he's going high outside and to pull it that far he had one thing in mind home run you won't see that kind of a swing from Hernandez very often. So another member of the just missed club and one ball and no strikes to Gary Carter. Dykstra at first held on by Buckner Wilson down the line from third no score bottom of the third inning. Ball two. After Carter comes a left hand hitter, Darrell Strawberry. He struck out in the second inning. Two balls, no strikes. Got the inside part of the plate. Good pitch. Two and one. Well, that pitch was you have to believe that Gary was looking for something besides that fastball because it was low inside something he could handle. Two and two. That was a forker. Well, Dykstra continues to hold. Mookie standing at third with two out. Deuces wild. Two balls, two strikes, two out in the third, no score. And you have to be alive with Mookie Wilson at third and Dykstra at first. They may try to steal a run here. They gave Gary two swings at it, so let's see what happens. You certainly be looking for it. Dykstra holding. And fisted on the ground to Barrett. He'll feed Owen, and that's it. They get the force play on Dykstra coming down. No runs, one hit, a walk and a stolen base, and at the end of three, no score. How cold is it in New York? Well, hot water bottles are in order in the Red Sox dugout. Towels wrapped around the can's head. And in the roof, there are heating elements. Marty Barrett getting his hands warm. The elements in the Mets dugout as well. You know, Vin, one of the ways you know you're about to get traded is when the manager asks you to wrap the towel around the star hitter's bat to keep it warm. And you're on the same team. There are more towels and bundles being used in the Mets dugout as well. Meanwhile Wade Boggs Marty Barrett and Bill Buckner coming up. Top of the fourth inning no score. Strike on one. On a cold night like this if you are jammed or if you are if you hit one off the end of the bat you'll feel it until game seven if there be such an animal. Game one of spring training. Mm. In there again. The darling who has had a high of 12 strikeouts and he turned it in twice against the Dodgers with throwing strikes and he's had the edge against the hitter at almost every at bat. Oh and two. Got him. The way Bob strikes out he becomes strikeout victim number three for darling and the battle will be Marty Barrett. I think it goes back to scouting report. Uh, you hear about pitches, but until Seven you Lakeland, face them, Marty Boggs, who tries Barrett. to program himself the day before and mentally picture four times at bat, he's just never faced Darling that much to where he can program himself. Marty Barrett singled into the hole. Remember, he got a pitch away and poked it into right field. Tim Tuffle smothered it, but it went off his glove. Looked like a slider on the outside corner for a strike going one. That's what it was and that's the one pitch that Marty guards against because you watch him when he strides in he goes right at that ball and he'll hit it from the middle of the diamond to the right field line. They'll play him in right center field. Good good man with the bat. He makes contact. Oh and one the count of Marty Barrett. 
One and one. It's an Ivy League time of year. The retiring president, Chubb Feeney, a Dartmouth man, will surrender the reins to a Yale man. Ron Darling went to Yale. Nobel Prize winner was a professor of chemistry at Harvard. So it's a big year for the Ivy League. One and two. And of course, what a year for Boston. With the Patriots in the Super Bowl, the Celtics winning the NBA, John McNamara's band in the World Series. What a year. Good old Vinny Orlando next to him. Boy, what memories he has. He's been the Red Sox a long time. One ball and two strikes to count. Interesting to see Don Baylor sitting in the bench gesturing to one of his teammates. One and two in the dirt. You know, when you think about it, with Buckner playing, Don Baylor at tonight anyway is right back where he was when he played for the Yankees on the bench with a right hander pitching. And of course, this time it's because there's no DH in the National League Park. But he knows he's going to get a chance over there. He was hoping he'd get a chance. <laughs> get his hacks at Fenway. Two and two to Marty. He shook him all the way around. Marty, very tough man to strike out. Only 31 times all year. However, Kirk McCaskill got him twice in one game in the LCS. He has two strikes. And chased it. That's the pitch he tries to guard against, but they got him this time. And I would say that the Mets scouts did a pretty good job on scouting Marty Barrett. What's well, very interesting with all the numbers, and you talk about it, none of it really means anything because they've never seen each other. It's not as if you're playing against American League pitchers who know you and you know them. It's out of the strike zone, but with two strikes, you're going to protect against it. And again, you may hear about a pitcher, but until you face him, you have to make up your own mind. Two down, here's Buckner. And the only surprise strategically so far was in the first inning with Barrett, the leading base dealer at first and one out. And John McNamara, knowing Buckner has a bad leg, you should see him just hobbling. Barrett's not upset, gum chewing. But they didn't put a play on, and Buckner, who doesn't strike out, hit into a double play. Throws his bat and lifts it into left field. Well, we were talking about how he is teaching himself to take a full swing and as the bat gets across the plate take the top hand off well both hands came off he just was completely right. fooling through the bat at the ball now he's back Charlie Lau and he just throws the bat at the ball and I tell you running down the first base well they good naturedly kid him about being hop along Cassidy I tell you when your your requirement for a hotel room the most important thing is to be near the ice machine so you can ice down your legs that tells you something about the determination of that fellow. And you know what? With all of his injuries, he missed only eight games all year. And hasn't complained yet. No. Well, here's Jim Rice, grounded to third. They are not even bothering to hold Buckner on. I was going to say that would be a travesty if Hernandez was on the bag. Hernandez is going to play deep in back of the, can you say runner? <laughs> One ball and no strikes. Billy Bucks giving it his best shot down there and obviously in pain. Fouled away, one and one. Well, a tip off on Buckner, and he's admiration from everybody. He said he hurt his leg in the workout. He said, "How are we going to be able to tell whether your leg is hurting?" Yeah. I mean, he, he just looks like hop along. When he takes his stockings off in the dressing room, his left leg is much thinner than the right leg. His left leg has atrophied because of all the bandaging. The muscle has been unable to work. Fouled away. <laughs> And with all of that he's playing and with all of that would you believe he was the second man on the Red Sox in stolen bases and he was he amassed a grand total and he's wearing it on his back six the cliche calls the player who loves the game gamer you're looking at two of the best oh yeah we've got two down top of the fourth no score and Jim Rice who grounded the third the hitter. One and two. In the dirt to the backstop, and Buckner still can labor down to second base. So that takes him out of an easy force play. W watch how when he starts, Buckner, it's almost like he needed jumper cables. 
to get it going. He's watching it all the way. You know, this is one thing that Rice has done this year and choking up on that bat like he has. He just wants to hit the ball hard and put it in play. And he's done a pretty good job of it as you look at his average. Well, that wild pitch, as you can see, is thrown by a fella who led the Mets in that area. However, it's some consolation. He has lost a possible force play, but he's not really worrying at all about Buckner scoring on a single. Two and two to Jim Rice. Ball three on deck. Dwight Evans, who almost took Darling deep. Three and two. Dwight Evans does a Jesse Barfield on deck. Fouled away. Jesse Barfield. Playing for Toronto, what a great outfielder! Barfield uses the on-deck circle as a home plate, and he assumes his batting stance and tries to time the pitcher's delivery. I remember Richie Ashburn telling a story about Sal Magley threw one at him when he was doing that in the on-deck circle. A couple pitchers would do that. However, he at least stays near the on-deck circle. Fastball fouled away and he jammed him. Now that was the book. If you're going to give Rice a fastball, eat him up inside on the hands. But you're also playing near the gas tank when you do that oh, yeah. because if you get that ball out a little bit, and I would say if you miss by six inches, which is not a whole lot to miss, and miss that six inches towards the plate, you're going to be behind because he can hit out of any part. Three and two, the count of Jim Rice. Buckner at second, two out in the fourth, no score. And he's high and away. So the Sox now have runners at first and second. That's the first walk given up by Darling. And with two on and two out, Dwight Evans coming up. We're talking about Darling having to come inside. It's the best story to come out of spring training of 86, and it's alive all year, not to embarrass the pitcher. But it was Jim Leland of Pittsburgh who said to one of his pitchers, You're going to have to pitch inside. And the pitcher said, Have I been traded to Houston? <laughs> no. But once in a while, even if you have average or below average, you've got to come inside. Darling got away with it. Evans hit a ball to left center that would have gone out except for the win. Breaking ball fouled away. Dangerous, too. He got it up. That was a mistake that Evans just tried to capitalize on and just couldn't high curveball. There's no other way to put it. You talk about Walt Riniak, the batting coach, and you talk about Charlie Lau theory. Here's the perfect example of it. Watch how he gets back on that back foot. He'll wave that bat low and then get it back, set it on his toe in the front foot, and he's ready. Oh, and one. You know, Darling, a year ago, was a wild man, but now he has cut his walks down by a third this year. Just didn't get it. Oh and two the count to Dewey Evans two on two out no score. High fly ball into left field Mookie says he has it he's there. He's got it. No runs one hit two left and at the end of three and a half innings the Red Sox nothing and the Mets nothing. Would you believe a good year blimp first appeared at the 1925 World Series won by the Pirates over the Washington Senators in seven games. Here's Daryl Strawberry. He'll be followed by Ray Knight and then Tim Tuffle. No score in the fourth. And those little stats that we gave you early in the game are holding up. The first game of the World Series is usually a well pitch game. Ball two. Strawberry has a hitch as we see Dwight Gooden with a mouthful of tobacco who'll be going tomorrow night against Roger Clemens in game two. Watching Hurst between innings warming up, he threw mostly curveballs and he started Strawberry off with the curveball. And there you see that. A little bit of a hitch that Vin was talking about, but if you're a good hitter, that is called a timing mechanism. Yeah, but it's another reason why he struck out 12 times against Houston, and he struck out his first time tonight. So he is in a strikeout rut. 
That's a hitch when you strike out. Yeah, he loops that bat. Two and two. Laid off that one. Three and two the count. Strawberry had a long month of August, and he checks in against Bruce Hurst with a count of three balls and two strikes. Darrell went 0 for August, fouls it away. In the month of August at Shea Stadium, this fellow who amassed all the votes for the All Star game went 0 for 45 before the home crowd. That's OH. Ball four. That was a curveball, three and two, so he showed plenty of respect for Strawberry. And keep in mind, big guy can run, likes to run, and has the green light. He can go anytime he thinks he gets a jump. He doesn't have to wait for a sign. That's the second walk going into this inning, so Hurst now has walked three while striking out four. He's given up two hits. Now, Ray Knight is a good hit and run man. He does not have good speed. And if Johnson's going to use the running game, he might try that hit and run right now. Strawberry held on by Buckner. Knight was another fella, at least during the LCS, who was trying to pull everything. There's one reason why he was complaining about strikes on the outside part of the plate. Because Knight was opening up on almost every pitch. And he couldn't really judge that ball away. He's a high ball hitter, and you can bet Hurst is going to try and keep it down and get him to hit it on the ground. In there at the knees for a strike, going one. Interesting this baseball world. Ray Knight succeeded Pete Rose in Cincinnati. John McNamara succeeded Sparky Anderson as the manager, and the Reds won the West. That was in 79. Now they're against each other. Interesting, too, that Knight was third in the batting race that year. It was won by Keith Hernandez. The next year, who led the National League in hitting? Bill Buckner. And they're all in this duel. All in one. The reason they like to play hit and run with Knight is because he hits into so many double plays. He hit into 19. Second on the club to Gary Carter. No score, fourth inning. Oh, and two. Boy, what a lot of motion and in the fourth. He uses it as an off speed pitch and very effectively, as you saw by that. Mm. Pretty hard to wait back on that. Knight way out in front of it. Oh, and two. I'd look for him right here. Strawberry's got some ideas. Darrell. Nobody out's going to draw a throw. Always on the bench, you say, well, they don't have the pitch out on. Gedman. Yeah, just looked over to he's see. He's checking because he'll get some help from that bench. Strawberry doesn't go. And it's fisted foul off to the right and well out of play. Well, the count stays 0-2. At 6-6. Six, six. When he goes, he's a little bit like Ichabod Crane, but he gets the job done. He's holding. And it's hit foul down the right field line. Off speed pitch, and it looked like Knight was going to try and hit it inside out. Oh, he was looking for that one. He's a little disappointed he didn't. Put it in play because he was going the right way. He was waiting on it, was going to go to the opposite field. He's got that gap between first and second, and it was all set for him. He just didn't get it. Strawberry at first on a walk, fourth inning, no score. Knight will be followed by Tuffle. Remember, the Mets have one stolen base, and Buckner was almost picked off by Hurst. Buck started to come off the bag. With that shot, when you see Strawberry, his eyes darting back and forth, he's looking to Robinson for a confirmation. 0 oh 2. Strawberry has increased his lead just a tad now. And there he goes. 
And the off speed pitch fouled away. So Strawberry took maybe one more foot. If I were a scout, I'd really start to watch his lead because that apparently was a tip off he was going to go. I would watch more the way he was looking ahead, uh, looking to the eyes because he kept darting, looking for confirmation from uh, that's a straight steal. Now he finds the ball, but you could see he was something was on. He wanted to make sure. And many times that's what you look for. The base runner will tell you something. Well, he kind of tipped the message that time. 0 and 2. We'll watch and see if he takes the same lead. Fourth inning, no score. The Mets have one stolen base. Wilson stole second in the third inning. Mel Stottlemyre talking to manager Davey Johnson. 0 and 2. He's holding. Fouled away. Bruce Hurst has been in trouble in the sense pitching out of a stretch as we look at his honor, the mayor of New York, Ed Koch. Oh, and to the count. Remember, the Angels had only one stolen base. In their games against the Red Sox, the Mets have already gotten one stolen base in the first three innings. And you can bet that's going to be a major portion of their game plan. 0 and 2. The Red Sox are very conscious of the Mets' running game, so we're going to see a lot of that. That's one reason, I guess, why Gedman has thrown out 50% of the runners. It's a tribute to those pitchers. They do a good job of holding the runners on. Especially Hurst and Clemens, they really do a good job. He had 50% as far as throwing people out during the season. Gedman didn't. Four out of five in the LCS, that tells you something. You give him half a chance, he'll get the job done, and Hurst certainly does that. Throwing over there all the time, that just takes the spring out of the runner's legs. Boy, I used to like that when the pitchers did that. And the other thing is to keep applying heavy tags. Oh, yeah. Keep he, punching he, him in the leg. Oh, and two. Punch him anyway. Overhand and high. A little fork ball. It must be very difficult for each pitcher to get a good grip on the ball. And you just saw Hurst kind of arch his back. If you sit in the dugout for any time at all, you're going to stiffen up in the cold. The crowd is bundled up. One ball and two strikes. High pop fly on the left side. And it's Boggs calling. So Knight pops it up, one down. Strawberry is still at first. The batter will be Tim Tuffle. And once again, we'll remind our viewers we'll be selecting the NBC Miller Lite player of the game at the conclusion of the ballgame. Second baseman, Tim Tuffle. Tim Tuffle struggled against Houston. He's got some sock. Remember the first game of the week we did this year. It was a tip off on Tuffle. Davey Johnson let him swing 3 and 0. Oh. He is a definite hit and run man. I mean you can oh. almost put a star on that now. He single a left field remember in the second inning. Strawberry increasing it a tad. Doesn't go. Right. That's the thing when you talk about scouts watching the ball club that's what the player wants to know uh, who runs who plays hit and run who is hot. And you just guard against it. You know what they can do. It's when. That's the thing. No balls and one strike to Tim Tuffle. Just a side straddle throw over to first. No big move on it. And as yet, the Mets have not tried to bunt. They have not tried to exploit Buckner at first. Yet. Fouled away down the right field line, way out of play. And the count 0 and 2. John McNamara, a catcher in his playing days, pitched briefly. As we mentioned, managed five ball clubs the A's, San Diego, Cincinnati, California, and the Red Sox. And how sweet it must have been for him to beat California. They compare him a lot to Gil Hodges, and I think the same expression goes for John controlled aggression. 0 oh 2 to Tuffle. Interesting, too. You have John McNamara, an ex catcher, 
and the chief executive officer of the Red Sox, an ex catcher. You have Davey Johnson of the Mets, a second baseman, and the general manager, Frank Cashin, was a second baseman at Loyola in Baltimore. Maybe they think a lot alike. There goes Strawberry. The pitch is missed at the plate. Darrell is in there easily. Tough ball to handle. And, uh, I, I think they can, may have caught him a little bit by surprise. You can see Getman blowing on those hands, but uh, it's, it was a tough ball to handle. Straight steal. There's that head. Looking to the bag. High throw. Yes. Shortstop. Watch where the ball is. One handed. He gets behind it, but kind of three quarters it and didn't get that much on it. So five strikeouts for Bruce Hurst. Darrell Strawberry at second and Rafael Santana coming up. The second stolen base for the Mets. The Mets had first and second and two out in the second inning. First and second. Two out in the third, and there's a line drive into right center. Hindu is there to handle it. No runs, no hits, no errors, and Strawberry left on base. Now we'll be right back after these messages from your local station. Here's Dave Henderson making that catch on the ball hit by Rafael Santana, and Strawberry is left in scoring position. Friends, tonight's game is brought to you by Honda All-Terrain Vehicles. Come ride with us, and we'll show you America. And by UPS for express delivery to Europe and throughout the United States. UPS runs the tightest ship in the shipping business. Vin, Ron Darling in four innings has made 53 pitches, 39 strikes, 14 balls. That tells you something, and he's getting his first pitch over for a strike. Ten of the 14 first pitches were for strikes, so he's in command. And here is Rich Gedman now, then followed by Dave Henderson, and then Spike Owen. Good first ball hitter. Likes it up, so he gets it down. Ball one. One and oh. It has been a long tragic year for Rich Gedman losing his father and stepsister and he has held up admirably. Out away. Remember the concern in Boston when he took a foul ball off the bat of Dave Winfield it hit him on the shoulder he missed the final three games. But he came right back. They say he doesn't like off speed pitches that he's that rare left hand hitter who likes the ball up. One and two and that got Carter. Now that was a classic case of Gedman getting the top hand off the bat. A classic case. And it, Carter got it. That run. gets him right on the side. He comes way around. It's like a windmill. There's the hand going off and boom. You, what you try to do when you get that close is get that low pitch but that's the risk you run and Reniac is thinking I told you to get your hand off the bat but not to follow through like that. That's a mean shot you take a look like that. Yes sir more than once more than once. There's the hand and then there's the bat. Mm. One reason why Carter wears a helmet thank goodness. One and two. Squirts it foul up long third. Then you talk about liking the ball up and, and it's true most guys do really like the ball up because they can see it better and I've heard all kinds of pitching theories why you should pitch down Kurt Simmons had one he said that you should pitch down because if the bat was at the knees then you'd pitch up that's where the action is where the bat is hmm. it's a little left handed theory but then again <laughs> pitchers come up with them. I know pitchers say throw it down the middle high balls hit over it and low ball hitters will swing under it. He came to play didn't he or at least to watch. Two and two. Foul ball. The rich still up there. He's been beating that right leg to pieces so he's wearing that little plastic shin guard. Of course that's a sign of a big league hitter anyway if he's going to foul the ball it's going to be off the front foot the front leg. Certainly not the back leg if your bat is that late you're not in the big leagues. Two and two. Fifth inning, no runs, two hits for each side. The Sox have been a little quiet. They've had one chance. That was in the fourth inning. And that takes care of Rich. That was way out of the strike zone. Looked like that fork ball or split finger fastball. Well, that's five strikeouts for Darling to match Hurst's five. 
and the batter will be Dave Henderson. Take another Dave look at it. Henderson. Good spot. He missed it by a good foot. And again, you see that left hand not on the bat. That's the theory, part of the theory. Now you're not swinging the bat one-handed. You're letting go after you've made contact, if you're lucky. But every hitter, and Riniak preaches that, every hitter can't adjust to that. The hitter, it's like a puzzle. You have to fit that final piece, and the, and the hitter has to be receptive. Gedman is, Evans is, a lot of hitters. Buckner. Buckner, yeah, he changed. That's the third one. You know, Buckner said in spring training of 85, when he first started, he hit about 020. And all of the Red Sox were concerned. They thought, hey, he's finished. What's going on? And he said, no, just stay with me. And of course, he's had big years now. I tell you, we get the fun way. If Ted Williams is there, get in a discussion about that theory with him. <laughs> Can I get to the booth? <laughs> oh, brother. One and one to Dave Henderson. He's got a sore right knee, but as you can see, he's playing. Tony Armas says that the ankle he hurt in the LCS is okay and he could play. There's Tony. However, John McNamara has opted for Dave Henderson. Two and one. Hit right by the mound and whistled into center. So Hindu comes up with a base hit. He's one for two. And that's three hits off Darling. And it'll bring up Spike Owen with one out. For the sake of completing the thought, Ben, I just want to say uh, so nobody misunderstands it. Ted Williams is not a proponent of the Charlie Lau theory. I wouldn't think so. I just didn't want any doubt about that. When Carter goes to Fenway Park, it will be almost blasphemy to call him the kid. I mean, you oh, can't you call can't, anybody no the kid in Fenway. There's only one kid. That's right. Only one. In Boston. Well, here's Spike. The biggest game that Spike had this year when he scored six runs in a game. The only other American League player to accomplish that, ironically, was Johnny Pesky, who played for Boston. There's that good move. He got it too high. Take a look at it. Watch him put something on it when he comes over there. Comes set. And it, I mean, it's almost like he's pitching. That's what we were saying at the start of the game. Every runner in the National League knows all about the fake, phony commercial move. They know Darling's got a good one. Well, one. One and oh. That's all part of his pattern. Owen looking down to Renee Latchman to see if Latch might put on a play. Feeling that there might be a hit and run play on, and Henderson looks like he's braced and at the ready. Well, you got a combination up there, and obviously he'd like to at least stay away from the double play to get the pitcher up there. For John McNamara, after managing in the American League, this is really a jolt. Bow back. In other words, John managed in the National League at San Diego and Cincinnati. But John has to be thinking as an American League manager, and then all of a sudden they say, ah, oh, now you're a National League manager. You have to send your pitcher up to hit, and you have to think about pinch hitters and taking them out of the game. Davey Johnson, before the game, talking about that, he says the adjustment's going to be tougher on McNamara oh, sure. than it will be on him. Yeah. Having a DH is kind of a walk in the park. One and one. The count is spike on. We're in the top of the fifth inning. And that first game philosophy has held up so far. It's in the hands of the pitchers, albeit cold hands. Ron Darling and Bruce Hurst. There it was again. I tell you, Henderson just better not think about anything else but watching him because with that move, you can't leave a wake up call. You have to do it yourself. He about had him. If he gets a little bit on the right side, just a tad, he would have nailed him. One ball and one strike to Spike on. And Hindu fakes and the ball is hit down the right field line foul and out of play. Another change of role of course is for Spike on. 
during the regular year Spike had nine sacrifices. He's a good bunter. But when you have the pitcher coming up behind you that takes a weapon away. Certainly at Shea not at Fenway. One and two the count one out fifth inning. No runs three hits for the Sox no runs two hits for the Mets. Dave Henderson we said he had a tender right knee. But he looks like he's in the mood to do some running. Two and two. Again we repeat. The Red Sox had the fewest number of stolen bases in the major leagues for the fourth straight year. Henderson really given Latchman a long extra look and those are the kind of things that when you're watching the base runner the flag goes up you say uh oh be careful one out. Watching Darling totally uninhibited as far as throwing to first base there is a Mets pitcher during the series we might see it who hates to throw to first. Hit in the air and Lenny Dykstra is right there. Second out and back to first goes Henderson. Then with Hurst coming up they got him with fastballs they didn't even fool around. And I just wonder if that's what they're going to continue to do because when they asked Davey Johnson about it, he said we're going to give him gas. You know I'd like to conclude the thought at the same time I don't want to get into a scouting report. There is a Mets pitcher who doesn't like to throw to first and during the series if he's pitching we'll we'll have Keith Hernandez watched particularly closely and you will see Hernandez actually gesture to him, throw me the ball only because the pitcher doesn't like to go over there. Oh and one to count. Remember Bruce Hurst first major league got bat struck out. And here he is again. Oh and one. One ball one strike. I don't think it's right that I should mention the pitcher's name. I think I'm getting into uh, dead waters and that's not the point anyway. We just want to talk about throwing the first. Before the game Hurst walked through with two bats and somebody asked me if he was looking for the plug. <laughs> one and one. Strike. Good eye. I could hear him saying, What a time to swing the bat. <laughs> I have to pitch at Shea. I have to come to the plate in the World Series. Henderson at first, two out, fifth inning, no score. See if his top hand comes off the bat. <laughs> I just want to see his body stay in the batter's box. I'll tell you, it's tough to ask a guy who hasn't hit all year. He's like for uh, oh for ten years has been his slump because he hadn't had the opportunity, and here he is. And with the bases loaded. All right, Bruce, nice swing. Way to go. Good eye. Isn't that what they say in the bench? Hang in doesn't there. strike out. Hang in there. And at the end of four and a half, no score. Start it off. Darling struck out in the third inning. Before that pitch, Vin Hurst had made 76 pitches, 48 strikes, 28 balls, 10 of 17 first pitches for strikes. And there's a drive into the alley and left center coming over, however, to handle it is Dave Henderson. So Darling, who as we mentioned is a pretty good hitter, hit that hard enough, but Hendu ran it down. One away. They'll give him a chance to get to the bench as we watch this. He really breaks into the hole in good shape, Henderson, and really has to wait for it as it dies. Now we told the people how much Minuet paid for Manhattan. Yep. Who's the pitcher? What? Who doesn't like to? Who throw doesn't the first like to throw the first base? What am I going to get? Twenty-four bucks and a picture of you in uniform. Yeah, in uniform. That'll Hard close the deal. Okay. Here's Mookie Wilson. Sid Fernandez hates to throw to first the left handed the happy pleasant good natured Hawaiian uh -huh. there he is and Keith actually has to gesture come here come here <laughs> come over to me that's not really new I'm telling you we had a pitcher at Pittsburgh when they asked him why he didn't throw he gave a great reason he said I don't want to expose my bad move <laughs> okay one and one ball two 
I know the scouting report years ago on Kurt Simmons was that he hated to throw to first. So I and if you he, think a left-hander would find it very easy. But if you have a bad move, why show it to him? That's right. Three and one. Well, if one thing, the Red Sox might or might not try to exploit a pitcher who doesn't like to throw to first, since running is not that much a part of their game. Hit to right field. Evans fading, and Dewey is there. So two down in the fifth inning. No score. And the batter will be Len Dykstra. Here's what Dykstra does to a ball club. Now there are two outs. Nothing has happened yet. And you say to yourself when he walks up there, even with two outs, he might bunt to try to get something started. So he gets you thinking. He's already pulled Wade Boggs in close at third. So he's got you thinking before he gets in that batter's box. And that's always a plus for your ball club when you've got a guy like that. He is listed at 5'10. But there are those who tell you he's 5'8 on his toes. But when you see a kid like Dykstra, you remember that old line about little guys must prove they can play. Big guys have to prove they can play. Right. Well, he has proven he can play. I'll tell you, I've seen it. I've seen little guys hit the ball over the, over the fence four or five times in batting practice or tryout camp. They say, I'd like to see him do that again. Some big donkey will get up to pop it up and say, Boy, if he ever gets a hold of one, look out. That's right. Oh, and two. He's listed at about 160 pounds. Ball one. When he hit that home run against Dave Smith to won the game and set this place on his ear. He had that great line. Did it ever happen to you before? And he said, Yeah, playing with my brother in a game called Stratomatic, <laughs> where you roll the dice and then whatever the dice show, you you make that play off a card. Deuce is wild on Dykstra. Bottom of the fifth, no score. Bruce Hirsch comes into this game in good shape. He's had five complete games in his last seven starts, and he has put up good numbers, especially the five strikeouts. Well, that game he pitched against Toronto in Fenway was just a, just a great game to clinch it. Two and two. Got him. So that's six strikeouts for Bruce Hirsch. The Mets go quietly, and at the end of five, no score. For a pitcher and catcher, there's always a game within the game. Here's Boggs against Dart in his last time up. Boggs programs himself. Will he be right or wrong? Takes the fastball strike. Takes the fastball strike. And if you're looking all in the same spot, low and outside, they get him. So obviously they made up their mind. We're not going to give him any off speed pitches, and the fastball is going to be low and away. And that time they got him. And that's the best hitter in the American League. He let it. Look at that, only 46 swinging strikes. He takes that first pitch with the theory that, and it's, it's really a, one that's been around. Take the first pitch. If it's a strike, you know they're going to come back with it. And if it's a ball, you're ahead of the pitcher. He's got happy thoughts on his mind as well as the World Series. His wife, Debbie, is great with child, and they will name the baby Brett. The godfather will be George Brett. Ball one. Split finger. The last American League batting champion to appear in a World Series before Boggs was George Brett. Comebacker and Darling, a good fielder, stays with it. Boggs uses the center of the diamond and hits it right back to Darling. Boy, and on a cold night, he's going to feel this. He's in pretty good position. He got that right on the fingertips. You could see even before he threw it, just kind of flicked that glove as if to say a little stinger there. Here's Marty Barrett, who's the best bunter on the team. Knight comes up a step about even with the bag at third. Ball one. You could see him looking around too, Vinny, to see where the defense mm -hmm. was. And also, remember, it was an outside pitch that got him the last time, and that's the one pitch he likes to protect himself against. You gotta like this guy. Two and oh. Those who watch the Red Sox every day all year long did not find it that surprising that Marty Barrett would win the MVP. 
and very humbly Marty said hey there's so much attention paid to Boggs and Rice and I get all those three and one fastballs. I just can't. One. I'm I'm riveted to that back foot. He, it's a definite move with this shot you see it. And you ask him why. Two balls one strike. One out sixth inning no score. Fouled away. He might have been trying to take a shot to right and the count two and two. He hit 367 in the LCS. He had 39 chances without an error. Watch the back foot. Watch it. There it goes. Now, there has to be a reason, but we can't figure it out. Just timing mechanism, I guess. No, he doesn't know why he, he doesn't, doesn't know. No. <laughs> two That's two. Don't change. All three. I remember interviewing a pitcher after a shutout once on before every pitch, he grabbed the back of his shirt. Every pitch. And when I asked him why he did it after the game, he said, I don't do that. <laughs> I said, you did it every pitch. He said, I didn't know that. Sixth inning, one out, no score. And Jim Rice, along with his thoughts, he's due to hit fourth in the inning. Three and two. Fastball hit in the air to right center, but Strawberry is going to be there to handle it. Two down in the sixth. So Barrett going with the pitch the other way, and that'll bring up Bill Buckner. Now batting, first baseman Bill Buckner. Bill Buckner grounded into a double play in the first inning and then literally threw his bat at the ball in the fourth inning and singled the left. He got as far as second base on a wild pitch. It's interesting we're talking a great deal about the Charlie Lau theory of hitting buck fouls it away and taking your top hand off the bat after you have made contact and you're through the zone. Walt Reniak, the first base coach, the pride of Nettick, Massachusetts, had only 99 at bats in his major league career. And he's the hitting instructor. And I'm sure happy for him to make the big leagues. So now he can tell Doug Flutie and Joe Coleman to move over. He's the first guy from that town to make the big leagues. Make the series. I mean the World Series. Yeah. All in one. Joe Coleman pitched for Detroit, so he got a little taste of big league action. You know when you talk about him how many times at bat in the big leagues how about when Mike Jorgensen was released by the Cardinals because he couldn't hit they made him the minor league hitting instructor. Yeah. So you don't hire a guy by his average. You no, know. No. It's what he knows. And what kind of a teacher he is. Do as I say not what I do. Oh and two the count to Billy Bucks with two out in the sixth no score. Breaking ball, and that got Carter. Gary Carter was bobbing and weaving, digging that thing out. He's trying to get the low pitch. At the end of five and a half, no score. In the bottom of the sixth inning, no score in the ball game. Keith Hernandez, followed by Gary Carter, and then Daryl Strawberry. Hernandez flied to center in the first inning, fouled out in the right field corner to Dewey Evans in the third. The Mr. Consistency of the New York Mets. Ball one. To back up the point, in 1984, Keith hit 311. In 1985, he hit 309. So in 1986, he hit 310. Two and oh. 94 walks are Hurst up against a man who knows the strike zone. Bruce has pitched very well. He has limited the Mets to two hits while striking out six. He thought that was a strike, and so did the bench, but Kibber motioned that the ball was high. 2 0. Oh. In there. Great piece of pitching there. He had to come in with the fastball, but he was going to keep it to the outside part of the play, and he wasn't going to give him a ball he could pull. 2 and 1. Just missed. Three and one. So Hurst now is behind to a very knowledgeable hitter with Carter and Strawberry coming up. Three balls, one strike. And that's what he did all year long. Opens up the inning with a walk. Four walks given up by Bruce Hurst. 
And the batter will be Gary Carter. Remember earlier, John McNamara appeared to be upset about Hurst's control, and he had Al Nipper get up in the bullpen. There is no action down there for the moment. Gary Carter grounded to second and hit into a force play. All year long, the big question was would Carter's knee hold up? And it did. A busted bat hit up the middle for a base hit. Hernandez to second and holding. So Carter shatters his bat and gets a base hit to center. It's out of the strike zone. And the bat just breaks in half. How did he break the bat hitting it off the end of the bat? You'd think it would break it when you jam it. No, end of the bat will do that. I guess if he can swing it as hard as he can. He didn't swing that hard at yeah. that, though. It just hit right off the end of the bat. They're just not making trees like they used to. <laughs> Steve Crawford gets up in the Boston bullpen. Two on, nobody out. Strawberry, Knight, and Tuffle do up. There's Steve. So first Gedman and now Owen come to the mound to talk to Bruce Hurst. Hernandez at second, Carter at first. Nobody out, no score, sixth inning. Just setting up, he'll be covering in case the ball is hit back to Hurst. Strawberry struck out in the second inning and walked in the fourth. High pop foul and out of play. Strawberry tried so hard to time that off speed pitch. Well, you talk about twisting and turning in the wind. And he still couldn't do it. Oh, and one. Boggs about even with the bag. The outfield is straight away. Pinching the middle, so they're giving him the lines. In there. So now he has Strawberry by the neck, 0 and 2. Boy, that was a big breaking curveball. That's the kind when you were a kid you called a drop. Mm. Roy Campanella called it public enemy number one. I agree. 0 and 2 to Darrell. Got him on the inside corner as Hurst picks up his seventh strikeout. And get Strawberry for the second time tonight. And usually in a spot like that, you'll see a pitcher work and try to set up a pitch. Not Bruce Hurst. He just went right after him, and then he throws it right there. Big curveball. And I'll tell you, when it breaks that much, that's like a scholarship to broadcasting school. Yep. One away, and here is Ray Knight. Interestingly, he had an unusual game in July against the Astros. He struck out four times against left-handed Jim Deshays, and in the tenth inning, hit a home run against left-handed Frank DePino for a tie and win it 6-5. Hot one to third. Boggs down to second for one. On to first. Double play. No runs. One hit. One left. We got a dandy, and we'll be right back after these messages from your local station. At the start of the game, it seemed like a rather insignificant note compared to all the notes we give you throughout the year and throughout the game and throughout the series. But it's true. The first game of the World Series, nine of the last 14 years, the losing team has scored two runs or less. And traditionally, the first game is indeed a pitching battle the last few years. Well, I think there are a lot of reasons for that, too, Vin. Uh, of course, you can't even talk about it in terms of the LCS, as exciting as that was. But ballplayers, for one thing, go into ticket business for the World yeah. Series. Guys you uh, never heard from. Uh, I know when uh, I played in the one I did, I heard from everybody in the Army except Eisenhower and MacArthur, the only two guys that didn't call me for World Series tickets. So that's a distraction. But I tell you, when you begin to settle down and start to play, it'll bust loose. And remember, the pressure is here. And there'll be a little pressure right now on Ron Darling as he looks down the gun barrel of Jim Rice opening up the seventh inning. No score.
twice doing what he did so often against the Angels chasing that breaking ball in the dirt. But if you make a mistake bingo. Oh and one. Each side with three hits. One ball one strike and you might have noticed Carter gesture with his arm once for Darling to get his arm up a little bit dropping it which is what happens when fatigue begins to set in, in the seventh inning. Fouled away and he really was coming over the top that time after the reminder. And Carter is always uh, he kind of takes a look at those hitters. He wants to see who the peakers are. Uh, we watched him a couple of times during our regular game of the week and hey by the way it's a good habit. How about that story about Hernandez saying to him if you call another fastball <laughs> we'll go at it right here and now. Well in the, in the pregame show it's great to explain it because Keith was trying to break some some tension but, but he did tell him that he was probably trying to break some tension today but at the moment he was ready to fight him. <laughs> Pitch inside it was a good story anyway breaking tension. I bet he meant it because immediately a Roscoe threw nothing but sliders and struck out Kevin Bass and it was over. Well he said as long as it was going along it was OK but when the tie run got on that's enough. Two and two. Big overhand jug in the dirt. And I was wondering whether Kibler was going to look at that and he'll throw it out. Meanwhile he came to New York but not to play and that's a tragedy. Tom Seaver now with the Red Sox has a date with surgery. Can't make it. Would that have been a story. But we have stories galore. Three and two. Missed down and in with the pitch and that's a walk to Jim Rice the second pass given up by Ron Darling. Stepping up to the plate. Now he has to face Dwight Evans. Let's take a look at Carter and his work behind the plate. Well, he's looking all over now. You see Wigwag. Watch him look at first base now. He's, he's checking everything and then finally picks up the ball. The Rice is aboard with the walk. Dwight Evans had a look at Latchman down at third to see if there might be a play aboard. Evans a long out to deep left center and we truly believe the wind cut down a home run and then in the fourth inning he flied to left way out in front of that boy that was a great move and then you talk about pulling the string he jerked his chain on one, one well Evans will look for a pitch you remember in Fenway when he hit the home run in that big game he said I was sitting on it and if he gets it he can pop it out of here. It's always well at game within a game we're talking about. Rice at first held on by Hernandez. Nobody out in the seventh. No score. Time. When you look at Dwight Evans up there, you have to remember he belongs in the Red Sox history book. Only Carl Yastrzemski, the great Yaz, and Bobby Doerr have played more games in a Boston uniform. The kid out of Santa Monica, Dewey Evans. He can do a lot of things. Boy from Honolulu by way of Millbury. Out off. Oh and two. On deck waiting his turn to have a rip. Rich Gedman. And again we'll have that wonderful battle of the former high school kids. Darling and Gedman. Owen oh to Darling his wife a most successful model in New York handsome kid majored in Southeastern Asian history when he was at Yale Rice holes and it's in the dirt squirting over to the backstop and finally run down by Carter. So a big break they get Rice to second with nobody out they take the force play away from the Mets and they count one and two to Evans. There's nothing you can do on this a 55 footer and it hits Carter right in the middle of the protector a little bit to the left once again it's that breaking pitch and you can see Evans uh, being the heads up better than he is he says go to second and he kind of push uh, Carter's trying to get the ball but he runs into Evans. You don't know where that ball is when it comes off you. I'll tell you what was so obvious. Darling opened up so much. His left shoulder came out as he was making that pitch. He had to come up short. That's exactly what he did. It was his left shoulder that caused all the trouble. A comebacker. Darling will hold Rice 
and go to first. In other words, if you and I are looking at each other, and let's just say I'm, I'm left-handed, if I want to throw a punch at you, if I pull my right shoulder out, I'm going to be short. I can't reach you. In order for me to hit you, I have to keep my right shoulder in, and now I get to you. And that's what he did. His his shoulder was so wide open, he had to throw the ball in front of the plate. Well, that's the first thing that pitching coaches always look when guys get in trouble. Is he flying open with the shoulder? It yeah. goes for a pitcher. It goes for a hitter. That could be a key play right there. Did not pick up the base with the out. Here is Rich Gedman. Popped up and struck out against his old high school foe and hits a ground ball right through Tuffle. Here comes Rice around third. The throw by Strawberry. He's in there. Down second goes Gedman and Tuffle was fooled by the bounce and at home played a collision and timeout Darling was going behind the plate to back up on the throw and he arrived at the same time Jim Rice is it's his hand it looks like too and Darling is down it was Henderson who was coming up Henderson wanted to oh. give a sign and crashed into Darling Henderson, the on deck hitter, number 40. Oh, yeah, I see it now. He's the man who got hurt. And Darling was in the right place, but up against the wrong man. He was just trying to back up, and the on deck hitter was trying to indicate slide or no slide, and you had a remarkable collision. Oh. And Henderson, hurting that right hand and wrist, we'll see whether he can continue or not. Remember, Tony Armis has a bad ankle. Here's the play again. Watch. See Henderson and Darling have already hit each other because Darling was in motion to get behind the plate and Henderson was trying to get up there and indicate to Rice whether to slide or not. Boy there's one for the book. That is really a freaky play. Meanwhile Tuffle will draw an error completely fooled on the erratic bounce. There's the collision. Now let's take a look at the ground ball and you'll see what happened to Tuffle. Down there just didn't come up. We talked about the possibility of the bad hops, and he, he was there in front of it. And the throw, it misses the cutoff, man. And that cost him a base. And the man who showed real disgust was Hernandez, the cutoff man. Because now one out double play is, is not in order. A man in scoring position. So one error shows up, and the other error will not show up in the box score. But that's a big base that the Gedman was able to pick up. Well, Henderson, who looks like the truck broke down on the way to the ballpark is going to try and stay in there. That was a freaky play. I've never seen it. I've heard Terry Harper of the Atlanta Braves dislocated a shoulder trying to wave a runner home while he was the on deck hitter as we see the ball go through Tuffle again. This first time I've seen the on deck hitter and the pitcher have a head on collision. There they go. Heels over tea kettle. And right down the alley comes Rice with the run, and it is one to nothing Red Sox. And very importantly, you have Gedman at second base. So instead of two out and a runner at third, one out, a run in, and a runner at second, and Henderson trying to pick him up. And the Mets have the uh, reputation of manufacturing runs, but the Red Sox just did it with a walk wild pitch error. And Carter now asking for time. He might be counseling Darling, might be thinking about changing signs, but I think he's also trying to give Darling a chance to pull himself together. It was Henderson who appeared to be the more injured of the two. It was his right hand and wrist. But Darling took a pretty good blindside hit as he was in motion trying to get behind the plate to back up. Dave Henderson flied to center and single to center one for two. One nothing Red Sox seventh inning. Fouled away. And remember tomorrow night. Tomorrow night it's the dream matchup. Dwight Gooden and Roger Clemens. Roger Clemens had a great line as we look at Gooden when they asked him about Pitching against uh, Gooden. Clemens says, I'm not pitching against Gooden. I'm pitching for the Red Sox against the Mets. 0 and 1 to count. Fouled away. 
That line is more applicable, however, in the American League than in the National League because he will be pitching to Gooden, <laughs> just as Dwight will be pitching to him. 0 oh 2. Dave Henderson. Boy, what a glorious moment, huh? After the ball that Gritch hit went off his glove over the fence, he comes back to hit that big one in the night. Check one and two. Rich Gedman standing at second base. He has shucked the shin guard that he wears when he's hitting. One away in the seventh, one nothing Red Sox. Jim Rice talking about Henderson making a good blocking back, I think. One and two. High pop fly into shallow right. Hernandez looking for Strawberry. Tagging up is Gedman, but I can't believe he's going anywhere, and he's not. All he wanted to do was to make Strawberry throw the ball and hope he might throw it away. But I tell you, the Mets had it lined up perfectly. He threw it to Santana. Knight was behind him, and Darling, the good pitcher that he is, was backing up Knight. So they had it lined up. But Gedman did a good job in drawing the throw. Now let's see. There is always a decision to make in the National League. You have a runner at second base and two out, and the pitcher coming up. Now normally you might say, well, put this man on and let's strike out Hurst, and that'll be the end of that. There's no one throwing in the bullpen. And McNamara and his pitching coach Bill Fisher are looking on. However, sometimes, not this time, they're going to walk on. But a lot of times a manager will say, Go after that eighth place hitter. I want the pitcher to start the following inning. But this time they'll take the bat out of Owen hand and they'll go against Hurst, who is not, by the way, on deck. So it's been a tough inning for Ron Darling, opening up with a walk to Rice, then the wild pitch, the error by Tuffle, and now the intentional walk to Owen. This is one of those situations we were talking about. Not that John would make a move, but you'd have to think about it. Do I pinch it? Do I have somebody warming up? You have to do that two or three innings previous. You know, I remember an expression about a guy who was cheap with a buck, and they said he gives up a buck as easily as he gives up a tattoo. Well, Davy Johnson gives up intentional walks about as easily as he gives up a tattoo. The Mets walked only 29 hitters intentionally all year. And no other National League team issued less than 55 ball one. So it's a little rare to see him do it. That it is. Now they've been able to get him with nothing but fastballs. He's looking for his first major league hit. If he'd get one here, it'd be a triple celebration. One ball and no strikes to Bruce. Foul back. Hey, now he, he just, made contact. He broke the slump right there. He his just brother broke the slump. Tried his brother who said, "Don't embarrass the family." He got oh, a piece of it. Oh, now you didn't have to put that up there. What an awful thing to put up. Struck out every time at bat in the big league. The Bruce Hurst Marching and Chowder Society will not accept that graphic. One and two. Hang in there, Dewey says, and Bruce wants to say, I am. I'm trying. Foul. Though he's made contact twice. Pitchers use the theory I'm going to swing and if the ball happens to be there where the bat is look out. Tell you one thing I'm amazed that Strawberry's playing as deep as he is in right field. He plays deep for everybody. I guess that must be a nightmare if he thinks Hurst going to hit one over his head. See you later Bruce. However a big run on a couple of walks and Tim Tuffle's error and at the end of six and a half Sox one Mets nothing. The Emerald Green Ring at a Shea Stadium nestled amongst the lights of Flushing in Queens, New York. And now things are starting to build. Seventh inning, one nothing Red Sox. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll see about that. I guess one of the great cliches as you look at Roger McDowell loosening up. And you hear it so often. How many times have you seen a player who makes a great defensive play lead off the inning? Well, okay, we can take that and turn it inside out because here's Tim Tuffle, whose error gave the Sox the run. Tuffle singled to left in the second inning and struck out in the fourth. And Bog 
Woods is deep and almost on the line. That means they open up the left side of the infield for Tuffle. And the four call. Here's that play again. He'll start to come up just a tad right there with the glove. And the ball stayed down. And that's the difference in the game. Tuffle will drag. They'll have to think about a bunt up there. 0 and 1. And strike two. Now he's in a hole. Just a perfect pitch on that outside corner. Tuffle followed by Santana, but then Darling is due to bat third. And I think that's why McDowell is heating up. Davies thinking about a hitter, especially after that collision with Henderson. You saw Gedman moved in an outside part of the plate. The way he caught that ball, didn't catch it coming up with the face of the glove, but going down. Little roller to that hole because Boggs was on the line, and there you have it. That is one of the most debatable points in all of baseball. What should have been a routine ground ball, since Boggs was guarding the line, is a base hit. And the, the thinking behind it is give him the single, take away the extra base hit, and they gave him the single. And now Wally Backman will run for Tuffle. Take another look. Box is out of the play. He can't make it at all, and Spike Cohen is running towards the foul line. There's nothing he could do. All right, you got one of the pests on the bases, either Dykstra or Backman, and it's Backman. So Backman running for Tuffle. Then Santana and a hitter for Darling, perhaps. Darling is on deck. Santana hit back to the box and flied to center. He had a chance to pick up a run. He flied to center and left Strawberry at second in the fourth inning. So we'll watch Backman, and so will Hurst. One nothing Red Sox in the seventh. The bunt fouled away. One one. Buckner has to compensate for his uh, injury and his legs, and he was off the back, indicating he's coming in looking for the bunt. Now talking to his pitcher Hurst, I'm sure he's setting up something to say, uh, either he's coming in or uh, come on over there and I'll break back. It's duly noted in the minutes of the last meeting. The first time the Mets really try to bunt comes in the seventh inning. Exactly what he did. I'll go in, but come back if you want to keep him close. Santana does not have much experience. Davy has had him sacrifice only once all year. He's choked up. And he got it down. Hurst has to go to first. Covering is Marty Barrett. And on the sacrifice, Backman, potential time run at second base. And coming up, Kevin Mitchell. Buckner. The key man, he's trying to come in, but he can't be of much help. Hurst has to make the play. And Buckner ducks out of the way to give Hurst a clear shot at it. You know, it's really heartbreaking to watch a guy playing like Buckner in the World Series on a bad leg. It's really something. But here's the kid from San Diego, Kevin Mitchell. And John McNamara going over to look at the candidates. And the first thing he'll do now is run a line through the name Mitchell. He has been used. You won't have to think about him later on as a possible right hand pinch hitter. Mitchell was about as busy as a kid could be this year. He started at six different positions and he hit first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth in the lineup. So Kevin Mitchell out of San Diego hitting for Ron Darling. And if you're wondering, Boggs is still guarding that line. That's the strategy that the Red Sox will use. There you see him. Ball one. One and oh to Kevin. And he has a look at Buddy Harrelson. Harrelson, when he coaches at third, is more vocal coach than a visible hand or arm coach. Tell you more about it. Swung on and missed. And when we get to Fenway Park, it could be very, very important for Harrelson and the decisions he makes with a runner at second base. What he will do on a base hit, he will run at the bag so that the base runner will pick him up. 
running towards the bag. And then he hollers, either you've got to go, meaning to score, or no, 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 and he'll hold him at third. One and two, foul ball. Dangerous way to coach. Yeah, it is. I said to him, you mean to tell me with 55,000 people screaming at Shea Stadium, you're hollering no or go? And he said, it's the rhythm. They know. I always say, you've got to go. One and two. He's been very successful. He's a good third base coach. He's very active, as you can see, out of that box. One and two to Kevin Mitchell. Backman the tying run at second, one out. Got him on the inside corner. And Kevin Mitchell, caught looking, becomes strikeout number eight for Bruce Hurst, to his pitch in a dandy. Big left hander in the jam is really coming up with the great pitches. Look at Getman slide outside and come back inside if there was any peak and he got him and once again look how he holds that glove inside the strike zone. It's not that he's trying to steal a strike. What he wants is that borderline strike and that glove is always in the strike zone. And I'll tell you another way you can watch the catchers and see how many balls they drop. This kid doesn't drop many. Well here now is Mookie Wilson with two out and the time run at second base. Bruce Hurst like Ron Darling has struck out eight. Fastball on the outside corner. Calvin Schiraldi, the ex Met, is heating up, if you can use that term tonight, in the Red Sox bullpen. 0 and 1. One ball, one strike. The difference in the game is in that error column. The Mets, who made just one error in the league championship series, make an error that has changed the game around. Hurst wants to make sure that the right side of the infield is set properly. Evidently, somebody in the bench hollering to Buckner where to play and Marty Barrett. Though they're afraid Wilson will go the other way. One and one. One and two. He was trying to pull that pitch, and there's no way he's going to hit it. Impossible. It was a good pitch to the outside part of play, maybe even out of the strike zone. One and two the count two out in the seventh one nothing Red Sox and it's the beginning of the first time World Series managers to begin to sweat. Two and two. You took that shot. We took that shot of McNamara in the background. You saw the blue book. That's the scouting report. There it is. And they're just constantly checking it. Two balls two strikes and two out to Wilson who is one for three tonight. Backman the tying run at second. Ground ball smothered by Boggs on his feet throws him out fine play by Wade he was able to move and get the one that he couldn't get on Tuffle. and the tying run is left at second and it's one nothing Sox. Here's the big play of the game so far Boggs guarding the line gets a good jump down on his knees makes the long throw. It's almost like Boggs is saying, well, if I'm not going to get any hits, nobody else is going to get any. He set himself and down he goes in the webbing. That's the key play so far. Well, Wade Boggs is going to start it off in the eighth inning against Roger McDowell, who comes into the game since Darling went out for Mitchell. And remember, Wally Backman. And let's check. There is McDowell, but Mitchell is staying in the game. Kevin is in left field. So since Wilson made the last out, it's a two for one National League switch. And John McNamara came out to John Kibler to ask about it. Kevin Mitchell is now in left field, batting ninth. The pitcher, Roger So Mitchell is in left field, batting ninth. The pitcher goes in the last out spot, the leadoff role of Wilson. Roger McDowell. I can be wrong as he pitches to Wade Boggs, but I would swear that Gene Mark, back in the early 60s, invented the two for one switch. If I had a bet on that bet on Gene. Yeah. Strike one. I can never remember prior to Mark's managerial time in Philadelphia the two for one switch, which we see every day now. 0 and 1 to count. Boggs hammers it right at Santana. So Wade. A bullet to short, one away. And Boggs goes 0 for 4. Roger McDowell is a youngster out of Cincinnati who set a Mets club record 
Second he was in 75 Ball. games and he tied with Toronto's Mark Eichhorn for the Major League lead with 14 relief wins. He also had 22 saves. He is basically a sinker curveball pitcher. And here's Marty Barrett single struck out and flied to right. When you talk about a sinker ball you'll see it. It is a hard sinker. He'll get a lot of ground balls if he's got that good one going. That There's was. a sinker and a comebacker. That's another thing if you're a sinker ball pitcher you are so accustomed to balls being hit back at you that you have to develop over the years a very good follow through. He was in perfect position to handle the comebacker. You're going to get a lot of those ground balls. Look and at this follow through. And it's a heavy ball too. Look at the weight. Now he's ready. Weight equally distributed. He just dances over there. Textbook. Two down and Bill Buckner. Who has the admiration of everybody. Including the opposing players. He is hit into a double play single to left and struck out one for three. One ball no strikes. On deck Jim Rice who has scored the only run of the game. There he is. One and oh. One and one. Back in 1974 World Series Oakland against Dodgers game five and Buckner represents a tying run at the plate eighth inning. He hits a shot into the outfield that gets by Billy North backed up by Reggie Jackson who throws to Dick Green who throws to Sal Bando and Buckner is nipped at third and the Oakland A's go on to win the series 1974 but in some respects for Buckner it seems like yesterday Pojo is well bundled up. Gary Carter leaves nothing to chance look at him checking Buckner in the batter's box he'll look up at him he wants him to shake him off to confuse Buckner two and one all three someone described Buckner as having ankles like doorknobs they're going to have to have surgery then he strained the Achilles tendon on the left leg and he's playing three and one. One nothing Red Sox top of the eighth. Chopper to short it shouldn't be any contest for Santana. He just lobs it over there. So the Sox are gone in order and at the end of seven one nothing Boston and make it seven and a half. Bottom of the eighth inning the Boston Red Sox leading the New York Mets one to nothing. Dave Stapleton has picked up for Bill Buckner at first base and at the plate is Lenny Dykstra. And to all intents and appearances and sound, the World Series is just now beginning. They know what this guy can do. He's the guy who kickstarts his Mets ball club. Right. Bruce Hurst has been magnificent. He's allowed four hits. He has struck out eight. Darling pitched right along with him, but the error by Tuffle is the difference in the game. One and one to Len. Ball two. He had Wade Boggs on the move with that fake bunt, and he brought Stapleton up. So the corners were on the move. Well, two and one. He's got Boggs in close to begin with. As soon as he left the, the uh, bench, Boggs went in about 10 steps, as he should. Ball three. And now the Mets fans begin to loosen up. You have Dykstra, Hernandez, and Carter. And John McNamara begins to pull at the ground. He has Giraldi along with Sam Beto now in the bullpen. That's a strike. Three and two. He had Nipper early. Then he had Crawford. Now Giraldi and the left hander, Joe Sam Beto, who used to be a man. Three and two, the count to Lenny Dykstra. Big pitch for Bruce Hurst. Eighth inning, one nothing Boston. Fly ball into right center. Dave Henderson calling. One away, and that puts the lid on some of the enthusiasm, and it'll bring up Keith Hernandez. Of all the people here, I guess the fellow with the most mixed emotions would be 
Lou Gorman of the Boston Red Sox front office who had so much to do with the Mets as assistant to Frank Cashin in the signing of Dykstra Mitchell McDowell Aguilera. In fact there is quite a, a Boston New York connection and it really begins with Gorman. Right. That was Hernandez home run swing. He's going to try to tie it up. It's a situation where you have to try to get the extra base hit. You remember that rip he had on the ball caught by Dwight Evans back in the third inning. And he goes the other way, but it's just a fly ball to Rice. So two down in the eighth inning. And Gary Carter coming up. Carter grounded to second, hit into a force play, broke his bat, and single to center in the sixth inning. The Mets have had opportunities. First and second with two out in the second. First and second with two out in the third. A runner at second with one out in the fourth. First and second and nobody out in the sixth. The leadoff man aboard in the seventh, and yet Johnson has come up empty. Or one. So the Mets have had their opportunities and each time Hurst fights them away. Got the power guys up. They're trying to hit that outside part of the plate. And that's hit to the gap and Henderson appeared to go back and now recovers to come in and make the play. So three fly balls and Hurst walks off leading one nothing at the end of eight. Friends just a reminder this telecast is presented by authority of Major League Baseball and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form without the express written consent of Major League Baseball. Ben Scully along with Joe Garagiola here at Chase Stadium in New York as we go to the ninth inning of game one and the Red Sox leading one run three hits no errors the Mets no runs four hits and one error. The Red Sox will have Jim Rice who scored the only run he walked opening up the seventh inning advanced to second on a wild pitch and scored on the ground ball that went between Tuffle's legs when Tim started to bring his glove up and the ball hugged the ground. If you're wondering about Hurst who's on the bench right now in eight innings he's made 114 pitches 78 strikes 46 balls and he's getting that first pitch over in pretty good shape. 19 of 31. So one nothing Boston in the ninth. Fastball in there for a strike inside corner at the knees. Roger McDowell. He faced 21 batters in the LCS. 15 of them hit ground balls. He struck out three more. Right two. That's the sinker followed by the curveball. Two of the three tonight have hit ground balls that he has faced. 0 oh and 2 to Jim Rice. Grounded out. Walked twice. It's Carter checking for peekers. <laughs> well, one. If you are not keeping score and you wonder about the Mets in the ninth inning, it will be Darrell Strawberry, Ray Knight, and Wally Backman. One and two. Just missed. Two and two. Boy, that's a tough pitch to take. Wow. Well sometimes when you take a pitch you're completely fooled and you just want to look cool like I had it all the way. That does happen. John McNamara trying to get a jump on the Mets and Davy Johnson. Two and two. Fouled away. Of course no matter the outcome tonight everyone including Mel Stottlemyre the pitching coach and Davy Johnson. will have to think about that dream matchup tomorrow night. Roger Clemens versus Dwight Gooden in the Big Apple. Wow. There's Dwight. Two balls, two strikes to Jim Rice. Big bouncer off his glove. By the mound and Roger can't pick it up. So we were talking about his follow through and how he's accustomed to having balls hit back at him and he couldn't flag that one. 
That ball always appears to be coming back much harder than it is. He looks like he's in good position. He really put some extra on it. He was in good position. It just kind of goes off his glove. And as always, you're the last guy to try to figure out where the ball is. And his first grab, when he misses it, it's just too late. But he was in good position, as the replay showed. Just didn't make the play. By the way, there are three official scorers for the World Series. Red Foley of the New York Daily News, Dave Nightingale of the Sporting News, and Charlie Scoggins of the Lowell, Massachusetts Sun. Dwight Evans, ball one. That error goes right hand in hand with the run. No strikes. Here's where Evans really becomes dangerous because he can look for his pitch and he can handle it. One nothing Red Sox, top of the ninth. He is a very good low ball hitter. That's what makes this confrontation so tough. You have a sinker ball pitcher and an extremely good low ball hitter. You're talking about strength against strength. Carter makes a nice play almost backhands it like a first baseman that particular pitch looks like McDowell really overthrows it because he's not usually that wild. I mean he misses by a big margin and Carter backhands it makes a good play. Evans looking down at third base he'd like to have that green light on three balls and no strikes Hernandez got the green light. He is according to the scouting reports that I've read Dwight Evans is considered the best three and O hitter on the Red Sox team and again remember he's a low ball hitter against a sinker ball pitcher let's see nope ball four you, you give him two and oh three and one and he becomes really tough three and all oh, and you can see that hey, you're asking for trouble now they got a meeting everybody's going to go the whole infield and <laughs> McNamara runners at first and second nobody out in the ninth inning. Davy Johnson watching like a hawk no one throwing in the pen it's up to McDowell and the battle will be Rich Gedman. Now you have completely opposite that you had with Evans. Now you have basically a high ball hitter. You'd have to be looking for a bunt. Knight is in back and off. Hernandez is behind the runner and backing some more. So Gedman does bunt. There's a play at third. And there it is, a force play. McDowell to Knight, 1-5, erasing Rice. I just wonder if Gedman was able to pick up Hernandez way back. You'd be looking for the bunt. Knight was at third base, but as you pointed out, Ben, Hernandez back. Now look at Hernandez going back. A lot of room. Starts in and down he goes because he's caught completely by surprise. But Gedman's bunts right back to the pitcher McDowell. Easy play at third base. If Gedman bunts the ball the other way towards base first, hit. that's right. The bases are loaded. He could have had a base hit if he'd had his shin guards on. <laughs> so with one out, runners at first and second, ninth inning, one nothing Red Sox. Here's Henderson, fly to center, single to center, fly to right. And he and Ron Darling were in that strange collision behind the plate. You have Gedman at first and Evans at second, one out in the ninth. Off the corner, ball two, two and oh. This is rare for McDowell. He doesn't do this, get behind the hitters like that, because you get behind like that, you, you, you have to really come in, and sometimes to come in, they take a little bit off, and that's big trouble. You know it might also be now after about the fourth or fifth inning the players are beginning to realize they're in the World Series. Maybe all of that LCS excitement has finally gone away and now the realization this is the the end. He's high again ball three. The Sox have had runners in scoring position tonight three of them on walks and a walk has set up some trouble tonight. Anderson keeps looking at Latchman. He won't even look at him. Anderson wants to hit three and all. You would tend to doubt that. That's in there. The crowd, at least for the moment here in the ninth inning, sitting very quiet, which is not the rule here at Shea normally. 
We'll see about the bottom of the ninth when the Mets come up. But 55,076. Ground foul. Three and two. Henderson trying to give Bruce Hurst a little cushion, trying somehow to give him an additional run to lean on in the bottom of the ninth. With one man out, McNamara has got a decision: do you start your base runners? And the strikeout throw him out, and you're out of the inning. Ground ball, you're out of the inning. So Johnny Max got to make a big decision here. And Spike Owen on deck. I would say they're going. Runners leading, runners hold. Ground ball to the hole. Base hit into left field. Evans to third. Mitchell's throw is there. He is out of the plate. If he's running on that play, he makes it. But it was a decision Johnny Mack had to make. He decided the hole. Now the ball is a base hit between Knight and his shortstop. And Mitchell all the way on the fly. Watch Carter. He's got plenty of time and he forces Evans to slide to the inside. And Evans never does get to the home plate. He forced him way in. And Evans really turns out to be an easy out. A matter of a couple steps. Starting the runner, yes. Didn't start him, no. Evans out at the plate, however. Gedman took the extra base and went to third. Henderson took the extra base and went to second. They are now going to walk Spike Owen. And Johnny Mack has another decision coming up. Do I hit for Bruce Hurst and come in with Chiraldi? Here's another look. Look at Carter force Evans to the inside. And he never gets to the plate. He just kept forcing him out. Good tag by Carter. So Spike Owen hitting eighth in the lineup will receive his second intentional walk and Bruce Hurst looks at the dugout and starts to take his windbreaker off as Evans goes to the pits for repairs and it is still one nothing Boston and in a moment Bruce Hurst is still looking for a decision and they're calling him away. They're going for a hitter. The hitter will be Mike Greenwell who is the only left hand hitter on the bench available to McNamara and John rolls a dice trying to get a run or two he will lift Hurst and then give the ball to Chiraldi what a job turned in by Bruce he went eight innings allowed no runs four hits four walks eight strikeouts but of course if it wasn't for the error by Tuffle Ron Darling would be even with him. Of course Chiraldi the big man and it's been often said pitching will make a good manager a good bullpen will make a great manager and Johnny McNamara is depending on Chiraldi who's, con who's just finished his uh, warm ups and he's ready to come in down in the Mets bullpen Jesse Orozco is throwing back of McDowell so in the inning the Sox have had a two singles and two walks and have failed to score. The bases are loaded with two out. And here is Mike Greenwell trying to get them well off. And he lifts a fly ball to right center. Dykstra is calling that he has it. And the Mets dodge a bullet in the ninth. And at the end of eight and a half inning, as Bruce Hurst calls it a night, Shea Stadium wakes up. It is one nothing Boston. against a former Met, Calvin Chiraldi, out of Houston, Texas. He was a teammate of Roger Clemens and Spike Owen at the University of Texas. He has a great fastball, an excellent control, a good forkball. In the words of Don Baylor, Calvin Chiraldi could be the next Goose Gossett. Well, we'll see. And now they're alive and awake at Shea. 
time is called, there's something on the field down in the right field, a beach ball. Darrell Strawberry struck out in the second inning, walked and stole a base in the fourth, and struck out in the sixth. You might remember he hit a home run to break up Nolan Ryan's shutout in game five. The pitch that seemed to confuse Strawberry in the LCS was the low curveball, low inside, but Shirali outstanding fastball, and here he comes. Oh, one. If you wonder who pitched the last shutout at Shea, September 11, 1985, a former Red Sox, John Tudor. Ball two. Calvin Chiraldi trying to save it for Bruce Hurst. Ball three. All fastballs. Fasten your seat belts now. Three and oh to Strawberry. Strike. Outside corner, good pitch. Three and one. By the way, Strawberry can hit the outside pitch the other way, a long way, as Davey knows. Ball four, and the tying run is aboard again. The leadoff batter has gotten on base. One, two, three, four of the last five innings, and they've been unable to get him home. Ray Knight. Knight walked in the second inning, popped up in the fourth, and hit into a double play, a big one in the sixth. And Bruce Hurst hoping that his one run lead will hold up. Knight is now talking to Harrelson. He's not sure of the signs that Harrelson was flashing. Knight, a double play man. Johnson has played for the one run to tie it up. And you just cannot assume that he will not be bunning. It's, it's just Johnson doesn't play according to that famous book we all hear about. Ray Knight, 0 for 2. Bunning and down to get it is Stapleton. Throws. Got him. What a gutsy play by Stapleton because his first grab was not a true grab. And you see Knight at first base kneeling. Stapleton grabbed the ball, couldn't get it out of his glove. Now watch what happens here. Knight bunts it where he should, first base, right-handed thrower. Stapleton, he can't get it out of the glove. He double pumps it and still guns it in time. If you'd like a footnote to chew on here in the ninth inning, the last time the Boston Red Sox won a World Series, they won the opening game against the Chicago Cubs in 1918. They won that opening game one to nothing. The pitcher was Babe Ruth. Ball one to Wally Backman. Remember, Backman ran for Tuffle in the seventh inning. Night at first, one out in the ninth. One nothing Boston. Danny Heap is out on deck to bat for Santana. One and one. The only run in the game, a one out error by Tim Tuffle on a ground ball hit by Gedman that allowed Jim Rice to score from second. And Hurst is hoping that's enough. Fouled away. Boy, on such little things do big games hinge. A decision whether to run Evans off uh, second base or not. Johnny Mack decided not, got him thrown out at the plate. He puts uh, Stapleton into first base, and he gets the big force out at second base. Off speed, ball two. Well, what an emotional roller coaster Calvin Chiraldi has been on. As you see, the on deck hitter Danny Heap poised to bat for Santana. 
Will you ever forget the picture of Calvin Chiraldi with his face buried in a towel in Anaheim? Two and two. Ball three on a borderline pitch. He'll check at third. And he just did hold up. That's the one he wanted right there. Backman. He put the brakes on in time. Knight at first, one out. Stable and holding the bag. McNamara dying a little bit. And Johnson just staring and hoping. Three and two with one out. Knight goes. And it's a little fly ball to shallow left. Rice coming up and makes the catch. And Knight gets back to first. So Backman, a little fly ball to left field. Two down. And Danny Heap will bat for Rafael Santana. Chirelli got that pitch in a great spot. He really tied Backman up to where Backman trying to go to the opposite field lifts it to Jim Rice. Big pitch. Now Getman wants to talk to his pitcher. And I'm sure going over how to pitch the heap. Stapleton now wants to see what's happening. It's only right that Danny Heap should come in this game. Remember the Mets were shut out one to nothing in game one of the league championship series. The man who shut out the Mets one to nothing was Mike Scott who was traded by the Mets to Houston for Danny Heap. Knight at first held on by Stapleton. Right. Oh and one to Heap. Danny is basically a low ball hitter. One and one. It's strength against strength, fastball hitter against fastball pitcher. But if you're hot in a spot like this, you don't want to go with finesse. You do what Chiraldi's doing pump. One and one. In there. And the Mets are down to their last strike. The Red Sox know about that. Hurst with his hands folded almost in prayer. Bill Buckner sitting next to him. One nothing Boston two out bottom of the ninth. Night at first. Two and two. Chiraldi looking over his shoulder just making sure that Knight is there and it's also part of his pitching rhythm. The difference between the two teams an unearned run. Got him and the Red Sox have beaten the Mets in game one one to nothing. A symbolic one to nothing victory when you go back to Ruth in 1918. There haven't been that many one to nothing games in the World Series openers and this gem will go with all of the others. You start with Ruth and you wind up with Hurst and Chiraldi as Johnson and the Mets wind up with nothing. One run five hits and no errors for Boston. No runs four hits and one error for the Mets as Hurst gets his win and tomorrow night as Seaver can congratulate Hurst we get Gooden and Clemens. Hurst didn't need that much help. He needed a defensive play from Boggs. He got it and they got a defensive play from Stapleton at first base on that bunt. And outside of that, it was all Bruce Hurst. He really pitched himself a tremendous ball game. And here was the difference between Bruce Hurst and Ron Darling, the difference between winning and losing, and the difference between a good night's sleep and a nightmare for Tim Tuffle. There it is. And Plus he, this. This is a good play. Because one had gotten by him, but Boggs one knee. And Stapleton at first base, the butt by Knight, it's in the proper spot, right handed thrower. Stapleton reaches in, can't get it out, and then finally gets it out and really puts something on that throw. And in time, big play. So it's a one to nothing Red Sox win with Gooden and Clemens tomorrow night. And game one is history. We'll be right back.